Ms. Mealy, may I wish to make a point here that in spite of the appearances of being terrible mortal enemies, there was some covert cooperation going on. And one of the other areas of this covert cooperation was in the fact that in the period of 1933 to approximately 42, they were smuggling out Jewish scientists who were working on mind control and other projects. And this was essentially allowed by Germany. Even Einstein was yeah. smuggled out. He was smuggled out. He, he did not leave... Uh, because he was thrown out. This is a total fiction. He left in 1930, before the rise of power of Hitler with his full power, because the National Socialist Party considered him an asset, wanted him to leave, and his, to stay, I'm sorry, and his friends told him, you better get out while you can, because after the war, or let us say the build-up to full power of the Nazis comes into place, you're not going to be able to get out. And he was a pacifist. He knew there was going to be war eventually, so he moved to the U.S. to Caltech, taught there for three years, and was invited to join the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton, which he did in 1933, and remained there till his death in 55. But there were many others smuggled out. They did a lot of work on mind control in Nazi Germany during the war, much of it in centering around indoctrination of the SS troops involving supersonic sound impingement on the occipitals of the brain, and uh, it was quite successful. Ultrasonic. Ultrasonic, correct. The Japanese worked on RF techniques, and that has been swept under the rug and was never admitted to by the U.S. government. The stories of the Buck Rogers screws that went into Germany are fairly well known. What is not well known is that some 26 railroad car loads full of patents and other technical data were seized by the British and the Americans and the French when the war was over. And these were technical processes which we did not have and we wanted, and that was one of the aspects of the war. Actually, I've heard stories in Renato Vesco's book, Intercept But Don't Shoot, that there were miles of boxcars. There were nine kilometers from one underground huge city, and... 20, uh, excuse me, and, and 16 kilometers from another city, miles of uh, boxcars with, loaded with designs, with blueprints, with machinery, with sophisticated equipment, and so yeah. on. Include the equipment and the machinery and working models of devices, yes, it would be a lot more than 26 boxcars for sure. But this whole business of uh, interchange and cooperation took place covertly. The war ended. And, of course, certain of the Nazi hierarchy, namely SS Chief Galen, who was uh, the security chief for Hitler, in a deal worked out by Roosevelt before he died, all of this uh, group of intelligence people was transferred to the United States and formed later the backbone of the CIA. The deal was in order to obtain and retain the surveillance crews and groups which were already in Russia in place. The U.S. agreed to have these people be transferred to the U.S. so we would have the capability, and these people would be left alone. This is the price. They said, we will do what you want and cooperate with you, but you leave us alone. At the same time, Russia captured another portion of the SS officers, and they had them uh, transfer the SS spies in the United States to the Russian interest. <laughs> so basically, the very same things have been going on on both sides of the curtain, which was a Mickey Mouse curtain to start with. All right, now let us get back to the technical side of this. And the, the Phoenix Project. Right, these people, the scientists from Germany, were held in hiding, so to speak, while the war was on. And when the war was over and 47 rolled around, they went to work for a U.S. national laboratory called Brookhaven National Laboratories at Brookhaven, Long Island. And that first and primary project there for many years was mind control. They worked on this for some 20 years, up until about 1968. Now, since Brookhaven is a national laboratory funded by tax money, they must, under law, report what they're doing in all departments and all projects once a month. Who's on them, what they're doing, what they're accomplishing, what they're not accomplishing, and whether they're going to cancel a project, whatever, the whole nine yards of reporting of what the activities of that laboratory is, or any national laboratory in the U.S. that's receiving tax monies. So this went on for about 20 years. In about 1968, somebody started reading these reports in Congress. Finally. Finally, after 20 years. And they looked at this stuff, and they said, mind control? And they're getting results? They might use this stuff on us. Cancel the project. The project was canceled. And the orders also came down that these scientists who were working on the project were removed out of Brookhaven, and they were. So they started looking for a new home. 
And since they were already at Brookhaven, which is more than halfway to the eastern tip of Long Island, it didn't take them too long in looking around to find that Montauk had a military base called Fort Hero. And the Army there was quite interested in what they were doing. They said, why don't you come here and work with us? We'll give you a haven and you can continue your work. So they did. So from Brookhaven, they moved to Long Island Haven. If you want to call it that. A Long Island Haven at Montauk in the underground of Fort Hero. Now, Fort Hero was actually a very large installation, and it was right around a state park, which was built sometime in the period, I think, prior to World War II. How many submarines could dock in these underground pens simultaneously? Now, from what I understand, only two. It was not an extensive Navy operation. It was basically Army. And it was, of course, a, a uh, defense point during World War I and World War II with the old railroad carriage guns and all of the heavy ammo and such. All of this was abandoned and torn down after World War II. And the radar came in with several systems, and then the Air Force moved in and took over some buildings and did continuing radar work, experimental, and built the SAGE system, and then that was eventually scrapped in 69. Now, it was interesting to note that the people from Brookhaven, and the Jewish scientists and those related to them and working with them, moved out to Montauk about 68, and the base was then formally abandoned by the military in 69. And it became noted on the GAO, General Accounting Office records, that it was an abandoned surplus base. Well, I can assure you these guys didn't move out. It was the ideal cover for them. And they continued to work. Well, I've noticed that what they do is they keep the essential people and then ro they rotate the non-essential military personnel in, in order to keep the secrecy. They have one group coming and digging the base, another group coming and doing the concrete, a third one does the interior fittings and <laughs> decoration, a fourth one does the initial part of the research, a fifth, a sixth, a seventh, and that's how through this time-wise compartmentalization uh, the track is lost of go what goes on down there. Right. And of course, they also had built years before, when I don't know, their own electrical power plant. They had four generators of a half a megawatt each in a separate building, and uh, they did for years supply the power, but when they built the later follow-on Phoenix project, they had so much trouble with those generators, they had to stop using them and go to local power, which is Long Island Lighting Company, usually called Lilco, and uh, take power from their lines, but this is much later. Now, the project continued from 69 onward on an abandoned military base, but certain other things also took place in that period which were moved out there also, because this was called the Phoenix Project from about 47 on and became for many, many projects. Umbrella. A real umbrella. Now to get back to this thing, when they resurrected the project, when Neumann found the answer, he also had built and designed this computer. A new system was delivered to the Navy and tested in 1953. And it was fully successful, no personnel side effects. And therefore the Navy now changed the name again from its classification of 1940, which was the Project Rainbow. They changed it to the Phoenix Project. It's a continuation of the same project, but again under a new name. The Phoenix Project became an umbrella for many, many things. Now, of course... Can you name a few? That are just the, 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 just oh, the yeah. most important ones? I can. But I want to uh, show the time frame of what happened yeah. here to this. So they continued on with after 1953, and of course it went through many generations, and uh, the equipment became small, almost portable, and still worked, and worked very well. How and portable? Uh, down so to the point, case, so down, to a, case? down to the size of essentially of an attaché case, right. in the latest systems. They do have the capability of making a secret service operator for the president or the government invisible, either with carry-on hardware on his belt or his back or a suitcase, or by treating him in a field which will render him physically invisible without carrying hardware for a period of about 72 hours. Now this technique is good for that period of time, but when he comes out of it, he gets very sick and very nauseous for days. Uh, the use of the hardware apparently produces no nauseous side effects. In any case, this project continued on, and eventually, while it was initially at uh, Brookhaven, it also was moved to Montauk. And that was what was called P2, or Phase 2, the Invisibility Project. Phase 1 was, of course, the Mind Control, which they developed some very successful techniques in the late 70s. 
The Philadelphia Experiment hardware and process was continued, and uh, they became very successful with that. It is now installed on all of the supercarriers, all of the fighter aircraft, both Army and Navy, Israeli fighter aircraft, and uh, the B-1 bomber, the B-2, which of course is a stealth bomber, and it is very successful. But that's only one of the side aspects. The real main factors of what went on at Montauk were Phase 3, which was, of course, the development to a much higher degree, time travel, which was discovered by the Germans in 1945. That process was removed and the war was over and went to Montauk. And even prior to that, Dr. John von Neumann had created a time machine. There was no problem in doing this because the technology for the Philadelphia experiment was so similar that it only be, be carried a little bit further mm -hmm. with certain controls, and they had a time machine. But there was a separate time machine installation that was yeah. not using the ship's No, coil. it was totally separate. It was fairly small, and Van Neumann did this on his own at the Institute, under the nose of the Navy, without letting the Navy know what he was doing. And, of course, he was not working for the Navy. He was working for the Institute. His time was, machine hobby, his little hobby. His little hobby. Right. But tell us how, how the Philadelphia led to the Phoenix, I mean, to the time tunnel. How did the idea for the tunnel appear? Who was the... The idea for the tunnels actually was alien, alien technology. We did not have the technology to do this. We had the technology to build a time machine, go either forward or past in time. But we had no technology at that time capable of producing a tunnel where in a person or an object could be sent down this tunnel to another physical location on this planet or another planet or another part of this galaxy and also shift its time reference. This was exceedingly advanced technology which only the aliens knew how to do. And the Phoenix Project was overrun with aliens. Uh, so basically uh, what the, uh, the Phoenix technology is ahead of the Philadelphia technology. Much. But basically the Montauk Project uh, set the pace for everything that came afterwards and did things which I don't think have been replicated. Let's detail a little bit about what they did. They had time tunnels. They were able to go to Mars, as Duncan and I did, to go into the underground of Mars to explore the underground caverns and the, the vestiges the of their civilization. civilization. Right, the vestiges of a dead civilization.